morning, church. Why don't you stand to your feet as we worship together today? my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that curse of truth. His body bound, his body bound in drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance seen by heavy storm, Messiah still and dark. Together today, let's lift this up.
good to be here today, gathered worshiping the name of Jesus. You know, Psalm 100 says to shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. It tells us to come into His presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips. So together today, let's continue to lift our worship to Jesus. Shout it out. 
I'll tell him in this place, great. Jesus, we bless you. We give not just our words today to you, although that's what you, you do ask us to do in worshiping you with our voices and singing and praising you, but also God in our lives, like we've sung about, we wanna bring an offering of our voice and of all of who we are, our mind, our decisions, our life, the choices we make, everything that we are about, God, we, we bring here today and say, this is all for you and hope that this blesses you. And God, the, the beauty of this is that both in voice and in deed, you are the one who gives us these things anyways. And all we do is we just turn this back to you. You give us voice, you give us the breath in our lungs and we just turn that back around and we just say, you have it back. We wanna bless you with what you've given us in our voice. And then with our lives, we do the same. You give us everything that we have and we just say thank you, thank you, but we, we give it back to you, God. We give all of our life back to you and praise and worship to you. So God, would you accept the offering that we bring you as Village Church here? Would you accept that from all of us? Would that be honoring to you in your name? Jesus, we pray this, we pray all of this. Just, just in your name, God, you're so great, amen. Well, welcome to Village Church. I'm so glad that you are here. My name is Jeremy, Senior Pastor of Village Church. You can have a seat. Uh, this is an exciting day because what we get to do, what I get to do is introduce to you a couple of amazing people who are joining our team. That is Brooke and Steve here on our stage. You see, why don't we give them a hand? We're joining our team. Come on, step up a little closer here. So, um, at Village Church, we have seven locations, and across all of these locations, we have various expressions of music and worship and, and services. Sometimes that looks like weekend services with live music. Sometimes that looks like worship events and worship nights and things. And as we continue to build that as a priority across all of our locations across the country, uh, it's important that we invest and we add into the team because Frankly, we have one person in our entire staff who is full-time as a worship leader, and that's Shiloh, who does an incredible job. And so as we are dreaming, we've been thinking about how can we add to this team for the future here at Village Church uh, across all of our sites and building up this culture of worship here in our country. Uh, we've had a three-year-old dream, which has been these guys, and it's just, God, would you create a scenario where maybe our, our paths would, would align properly at some point, as far back as three years ago, getting to know these guys, and we've had them do some stuff here at Village Church uh, at various times. And so um, over this last year, it became the worst time for them to say yes to something like this. Uh, they bought a house, had a baby, they were touring, doing all of this stuff. Uh, but God just said, no, maybe the worst time is the right time. And so God moved and we discussed this and they said, we're in. We feel like God's calling us to do this. And so I couldn't be more thrilled that we're adding these guys to the team. These, we could talk all day about how talented they are, um, awards and all that kind of stuff, you can look all that up. But what's cool about this is they have the heart, the heart and the posture of leadership that we want uh, at this church. And uh, you're gonna see that and experience that from the stage and just in being part of worship teams or worship bands uh, at any site that you're at actually here because of the influence this is gonna have. So we're adding both of them just to be clear. Okay, so we have like award-winning singer, worship leader, and we have award-winning musical producer, and we get both of them and they're both joining our team. So I couldn't be more excited about that. So let's give it up for Brooke and Steve. And uh, maybe we just, 
let's pray for you. Let's pray for you in this. Um, why don't you come a little closer here? Uh, pray for you in this because um, this is a big move, and there's there's lots that you got to figure out still. And uh, uh, we want God to be in this, and want God to give you everything uh, that you guys need for your family for this to go to go smoothly. And you know, so let's 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 pray for Brooklyn Steve together. God, thank you how you just write stories, and we don't even know sometimes what you're writing or what those timelines are and what chapter we're in. Uh, but God, for this one, thank you so much that you brought this to this point. And we are so excited for what you're gonna do here through um, our, our staff in this worship and production space, our volunteers across our sites. Just, we pray a blessing here on these two that you would give them um, everything they need to be able to lead well. And uh, for all of the transitions with their kids and moving and housing and all this kind of stuff, God, would it just go smooth? Would you just bless them in that? Um, give them a grace there so that they can just lean into with all that they have, everything that you have for them here uh, with our church. So we lift them up to you, God, and we lift uh, this ministry up to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give it all of them another round of applause. And uh, as we uh, jump back in now to our series on Revelation. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Hope you've enjoyed the book of Revelation. My name is Victor, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. It has been, to be honest, a little bit trippy so far. Just the first few weeks we've galloped through this book. We've seen a lot of imagery of Jesus with multiple eyes, some horns, lamb. We've seen creatures with faces of ox, eagles, human faces. And I'm going to be honest, it probably gets even a little more intense as we go. To be frank, this is usually where preachers bounce. They do a series on Revelation from one to maybe three, maybe four, and it just gets a little too nutty that they throw in the towel at this point. And that's where we are today. Uh, chapter four and five, we're going to go right into six. We're going to go into seven, and we're going to do a little bit of eight. So we got a lot of material to go through. But just to give you a little bit of a recap, I know we've only just started, but it's important because there's so much content Chapter 4, what will happen, is really critical to our text today, is John has this vision. He gets, he gets allowed to see things and Jesus kind of reveals things about what's going on in history. And he gets this sneak peek into heaven. It says the doors of heaven are open. So he looks into heaven and what he sees is he sees a throne. God on the throne, 24 little thrones around him of the elders worshiping him. There is creatures, these wild creatures with multiple faces representing creation, also worshiping him. It's this incredible spectacle happening. And in the Father's hand, there is this scroll, this scroll which commentators argue represents history, the mystery of history, the interpretation of history. And then there's this huge plot twist that happens. In chapter 5, verse uh, 4, it says, No one was found who was worthy to open the scroll to look inside. Huge plot twist. John is undone. And then verse 5, it says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. He turns, and remember what Pastor Fanu says, John turns to see the, lamb, the lion and he turns and there is a slain lamb instead. And verse 9 says, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation. So we see this, the cosmic implications of the cross. Jesus dying and being slaughtered on the cross isn't just about you and him having forgiveness and being reconciled to the Father. It has universal implications. And we're seeing that as Jesus now is able to crack open these seals, what you'd expect in maybe you've seen movies and like medieval movies with a king with his wax, uh, uh, the ring being sealed on the wax signet. And that would be what we'd see seven of those on this scroll. So we have two chapters to cover, a lot of material. And the first chapter kind of outlines 
these seals. Chapter 6. And just to give you kind of a bird's eye view of what's happening here. These are all the seals. Seals 1 to 4, we see the four living creatures crying out, Come! To God. Seal five is the disciples and martyrs, those who have died for his name's sake, saying, How long, O Lord? And then seal six, interesting, we'll get into this. Unbelievers cry out to the mountains, fall on us and hide us. And then there's this climax in chapter eight, the silence as the prayers of the saints ascend to the throne. Let's tackle this guy first, these first four uh, seals. Common to many of us would have been the four horsemen. Now, some of you have heard of the four horsemen and have wild interpretations of what this might be, Uh, especially in the West. There was a movie made called literally the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and it had everything you expect. These skeleton figures, hooded figures with skeleton horse flying through the streets of Los Angeles. And who can save the world? Who can stop the end times? Nothing more than... Uh, misunderstood U.S. Marine soldier and partnering up with an ambitious young female scientist. Together, they solve all the problems of the world and stop the end times of the apocalypse. It's very American. Um, 2.1, 2.1 out of 10 on IMBD if you want to watch it. Great movie. And this, this wasn't made in the 80s. This was literally last year. And so we all have wild interpretations of what this actually is. Let's look into this text a little bit. These four horsemen, they frame out what we call the tribulation, this hard moment in history where there's a lot of terror and misery. And look at how these four horsemen are sent out. Chapter 6, verse 2, and I looked, this first horseman, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Who is this horseman? Now, at first glance, it actually looks like Jesus. White horse, crown, authority, makes sense. Ironically, it's associated to deceptive forces against the church. The white horse is a counterfeit Messiah. Conquest language was not associated to Jesus in Revelation, but actually associated to demonic forces, the evil beast in the book. The goal of this horseman is actually to deceive and persecute believers. And then there's a second horseman that gets sent out. Verse 4, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. He was given a great sword. Red, obviously the symbol of blood and violence. Naturally, the second precedes the first. Spiritual evil always reverts to physical violence, representing wars, innocent blood shed. And then there's a third Horsemen, representing injustice and greed. Verse 5, it says, Behold, a black horse, and his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius, and three quarts of barley for denarius. Do not harm the oil and wine through this black horse with scales in hand, which leads to injustice, greed, famine, and hunger. It's interesting what it says, a quart of wheat, which would have been Enough for someone to survive on. And one denarius would have been a full day's wage. And so it's saying that if you work all day, you have just enough to eat. Let alone your family, your friends, your community. And then, of course, the injustice is while the rich get what they want. Do not harm the oil and wine. These luxury items only wealthy can have. There's injustice happening. And then it all climaxes in the fourth horseman, death. Harsh language, behold, a pale horse, and its rider name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine, with uh, pestilence, and by wild beasts on the earth. Hades, obviously representing the grave, the depiction of the grave now personified, riding through the earth, gathering up bodies and corpses. This is intense imagery of these four horsemen. These compounding events equate to a, they draw a picture of God's creation unraveling as we have our own way. And who's to blame for this misery? Who we point a finger to? Well, it seems this time of tribulation, Jesus almost commissions these four horsemen. If you look at first glance, I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. 
It looks like Jesus is the one sending. But who are they calling to come? Creation, representing these four creatures, are not calling to the four horsemen, but are calling to Jesus to establish his kingdom forever. And this actually only makes sense if we understand the whole redemptive story. What's at work here? Usually, many of you have been probably told a lifeboat theology, a lifeboat message of the gospel. It probably goes something like this. We've explained this before in the past. Your life is like a line. You were born here, a little baby, and the goal is to get here. And by the end of your life, you either end up in heaven or you end up in hell. And the goal is to live your life in a way where you end up on the right side of this. So you do good, you give your life to Jesus, you maybe mess up and have a bit of a testimony, you party when you're younger and you, you get married and you try and serve your kids and the family and all this stuff. You're going back and forth, you gossip a little. And the goal in life is kind of get on this side of the line so you, when you die, you go to heaven. That is probably a gospel you've been pitched, maybe in Sunday school. And there's, it's partially true. It's partially biblical. But the problem with this is it's the center of it is you. And what's fascinating in the book of Acts, which is the biggest proclamation of the good news, that the church is actually advancing and expanding, there's five primary gospel presentations, sermons in that book. And out of those five, you know how many times heaven and hell gets mentioned? Zero. That's interesting. And what we see is actually a more holistic picture of what God is doing, which we explained this before, is in the beginning God created heaven and be created earth. Heaven and earth overlap. God's space, our space. We see that all through these, these clues where literally what makes the Garden of Eden paradise is it's both our spaces overlapping. God would meet with us. He created us from the ground. He breathed his ruah, his spirit in us. Where it says there's these clues of like Adam and God would walk by the cool of the afternoon. His space, our space overlapped. What happens through the story of scripture is our space and his space now break apart. Genesis 3, we break covenant with God. We want autonomy from him. We actually get pushed out of the garden. There's guards now in the garden. You cannot enter God's space anymore. Where Genesis 1 would say, God looked at his creation. He looked at this and surveyed it and said, it is good. And then what happens in Genesis 6, where heaven and earth, in a sense, our space and his space now split up. He surveys in Genesis 6 when there's violence and he looks, that word looks, it's almost like he does a research party. He examines and what he finds is that there's not one good thought in mankind. They are provoked by evil. They move and rush towards perversion, evil, wickedness. He is looking at our space and saying it is not good. And then the beauty of the gospel starts to emerge as we see in all, throughout the Old Testament. God starts to move into our space. This space here becomes a clean space. There'd be the idea of the tabernacle, the temple, where we could actually enter into God's space, making ourselves white. Right? Priests would have to wash themselves, cleanse themselves, sacrifice animals so they could enter into God's space to meet with him. The temple would literally have images and statues that would remind us back at this space, fruit trees of the garden, the paradise, of what it meant to have our space and God's space together again. Ultimately, the finality of this is Jesus. Jesus actually takes on flesh, comes into this space where we can meet him, approach the throne boldly. We can actually come and touch Jesus, experience him, talk to him. And the beauty of the gospel is what we always don't see is what happens when Jesus enters his space. What's the thing he proclaims? Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. God is not just interested in making small, clean space for us. He is beginning to advance his kingdom back into our space. You know, there's five gospel presentations in Acts that we hear. You know how many times heaven and hell is mentioned? Zero. You know how many times Christ is king, his lordship is mentioned? Eleven. The whole centerpiece, this whole thing is that Jesus is king and is moving his kingdom into our space. And he invites us into it. 
Not to just be reconciled to the Father, not to be forgiven of sins, but actually participate in his kingdom. To be given the ministry of reconciliation, to actually be compassionate, sacrificial, loving, kind, giving ourselves over, as Jeremy said, to this cause. Giving our life back to him, what he has given to him, that one day, which we're going to see in Revelation 21, that our space and God's space reunite once again, that he is in the center of it. It is better than the garden. What was displayed as a garden, he says, is a city now. That heaven and earth are reestablished together. That's the redemptive story. And that is the backdrop we need to see as we look at this because as Jesus is breaking these seals, these seven seals, one after the next, after the next, there is an inbreaking of his kingdom moving forward into our space. The flow of misery that we saw with these horsemen only happens because there is resistance to that. It is not Jesus just sending out horsemen. It is God advancing his kingdom, and there is strong pushback. Where Daryl Johnson says the four horsemen represent the kind of things that happen when Jesus and his kingdom begin to press in our world. Not that Jesus coming causes the misery and terror, but when Jesus and his kingdom, when the lamb in his way come, there is resistance and opposition resulting in misery and terror. And we often see this tribulation as a set period of time in the future, and there's probably some truth to that. But in many ways, it started on Christmas Day when Jesus took on flesh and began proclaiming the kingdom is at hand because it doesn't take the theologian to hear the hooves of the four horsemen pounding the surface of our globe today. Like violence, as much as we thought we were progressive and moving towards a utopia, that we'd solve racism, we'd solve you know, violence against other nations, we'd be all see each other as equals. Yet the 20th century was the bloodiest century in history. 60 million people died. Greed, we all know the waters, the ocean are being overfished because of greed. We can gain more money and we don't care. But land too. The UN just recently stated an additional 16 million square kilometers will be degraded, unfarmable, by 2050. This is an area the size of South America. Death. Nearly 30 million disciples of Jesus were martyred in the 20th century. Bruce Maline cites a projection by some missiologists that in this century, one out of 200 disciples will die for Jesus. This is what Scott McKnight kind of explains of this resistance, this force, this thing under the surface. He equates it to Babylon. That's how he encompasses this idea. He argues that if we want to live the message of Revelation today, we need to develop eyes to discern Babylon's power, violence, and injustice in the midst today. We must recognize the Babylon all around us. Not some conspiracy theory way of thinking, but the question is, are you even aware? Are you even attuned to these things? If God gives the gift of discernment to the church, are we looking, are we watching? Not just even on a global scale, but as you drive through your neighborhoods. What do you feel? What do you sense? What C.S. Lewis writes, one of the things that surprised me when I first read the New Testament seriously was it talks so much about dark power in the universe. A mighty evil spirit who is held by the power behind death, disease, and sin. Enemy occupied territory. That is what the world is. Christianity is a story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us all to take part in this great campaign of sabotage. Do you drive through Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto? When you think about even Vancouver, you drive through these streets. Do you just think about the good ramen, the ocean views? Or are you like Paul? You enter into Athens. It says his spirit was provoked with him as he saw the city was full of idols. And you want to know the clues? You want to know what it looks like to discern? Just look at the people. Look at the fathers and the mothers. Look at the co-workers. Look at the business partners. Look at friends. Where are they downcast? Where are they disillusioned? Where are they discouraged? Where have they put false hope and dreams, invested time and energy into? Well, one author says, idols always break the hearts of their worshipers. 
What are the clues you can see in your own city? Are the problems maybe deeper than just bad government and voting right? Maybe they're deeper than be knowing that there's dangers and parameters to technology that's emerging. Deeper than just being uninformed on social issues. There's things bubbling on the surface that we can be attentive to. So what do we do? What's our responsibility? How do we engage? It's interesting. You actually look at these seals. You notice a trend. Seals 1 to 4, four living creatures crying out, come. Seal 5, disciples, martyrs crying out, how long, O Lord? Seal 6 is fascinating. Seal 6, which we'll see here. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. It's, this thing is loaded with Old Testament imagery. Great earthquake would have been Haggai 2. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. That's Joel 2. And the stars of the sky fell into the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit. That's Isaiah shaken by a great gale. And then the sky vanished like a scroll. Again, another Isaiah reference. And every mountain and island was moved from its place. The original audience, the original hearers would have known all this Old Testament imagery and they would have known that this is familiar imagery to draw a picture of idolatry flushed out to its furthest degree. This is what it looks like when you don't want God. You don't want God? Okay, be God. I'll step back and let you try and hold it all together. Since you cannot, God's creation unravels. That's what we see on this sixth seal. That is finally what the wrath of God is, what the wrath of the Lamb is. Not throwing thunderbolts or sending horsemen, but finally letting us have our own way. That is the horsemen. Unbelievers. You know, universalists will say, when you see Jesus truly for who he is, on this side of eternity or the next, you will have to fall in love with him. You see here, unbelievers don't want God so badly when they see it all, when they see the throne, that they ask, they pray to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne. But what you see here is a common trend. Seal one to four, four of them, they're crying out, crying out, crying out. They're praying the four living creatures are praying to Jesus. The martyrs are praying to Jesus. The unbelievers are praying to the mountains. The whole theme, the whole centerpiece of these seals is prayer. It's all prayer. Every seal is broken, kingdom in breaking. The primary culprit, prayer. Jack Lowell says the Christian who prays acts more effectively and more decisively on society than the person who politically involved with all sincerity of faith put in that involvement. If we believe that to be true, if we think prayer has that much of an impact, then why don't we? Think about your life. Think about how you participate. I think it's because of the sobering silence that prayer brings. What Dallas Willard says, silence is frightening because it strips us like nothing else does. Throwing us on the stark realities of our life. What if you stripped away the sermons, the worship, the community groups, the conversations about God, the content about God? What if it turns out there's actually very little to just you and God? You can't hide behind church attendance, knowledge, service. Prayer does something. It's honest with our reality and facing a God that we have mastered talking about, singing about, learning about, but we barely know. And even if that's true, in this very moment as I say that, you feel convicted, you look at the state of your relationship with God, you realize it's on life support, the invitation is still there. Jesus asks much of us. He does. But it's okay if we don't start with much. There's this pastor in New York City, absolutely exhausted, undone. He's trying to figure out how to do church during the pand pandemic, and he's in the thick of the pandemic, and these are his reflections. These are his words. It's Easter. Easter last year, in the middle of New York City, I walked into Times Square on Easter morning. There wasn't a soul around. I was the only person there. I simply went to the middle of Times Square to sing, Christ the Lord has risen today. 
I had no life left. I had no energy. I had nothing. But I said, all I want to do, Jesus, I can't control the future. I can't stop the pain in the city. But I just want you to know in the eyes of the principalities and powers the resistance, I declare the resurrection of Jesus over a city that is dying. Did it do anything? Not that I'm aware of. Zero fruit on my one-on-one prophetic stand in Times Square. Except this, I felt Jesus say, thank you. Where do you start today? How can you participate in the inbreaking of Jesus' kingdom in a city like Surrey, Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, Winnipeg, Langley? We can start exactly how he asked the disciples to start. In Matthew 6, 9, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is not a simple Christian mantra you memorize as a kid. This is joining in with all of creation, all of heaven, the people of God who've been martyred for his name's sakes, all declaring in one voice, Jesus is on the throne. Bring your kingdom here to our city. That our city leaders make godly decisions. That the poor and needy are cared for in downtown Langley, Vancouver, in Calgary. That refugees are embraced. That marriages and families are underpinned with kingdom values. That justice sweeps the dark corners of crime, child trafficking, sexual oppression in our city. The dead churches come alive in prayer on earth as it is in heaven. Simple prayer. But on to what? Like look at how... The seals end. Chapter 7, or chapter 8. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, the last seal, there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then he saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to him. And another angel came and stood at the altar with golden incense, and he was given much incense to the offer. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels. Is given power. Oh, this isn't it. <laughs> Here we go. With the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with those prayers of the saints rose before God for the hand of the angel. It's those prayers where you feel are empty. You feel are stupid because you don't have the right words to say. You feel I don't have the right theology and you're just crying out. You don't even know what to say anymore. They feel like they're falling flat as soon as they come out of your mouth. Where you're praying for your wayward son. You're praying for your broken marriage that's on life support. You're praying for that coworker friend that just doesn't know Jesus. And it feels like it is not landing and no one is hearing you. Jesus unveils behind the curtain. This apocalypse revealing He's saying, see Your prayers are like sweet incense that go up to the throne. You can't even see it. Every prayer is heard and his incense is sweet to the Father. There's this wild interlude between chapter 6 and 8. In chapter 7, there's these two visions. And these two visions are kind of uh, the same thing. Thing, but from different angles. It's pretty common in the Old Testament. Genesis 41, Daniel 7, Ezra 9. You see two visions of the, of the same thing. Vision 1 is uh, music to John's ears. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God. On their foreheads. <laughs> Sorry. Anticlimactic there. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Then actually lists out every tribe of Israel, this kind of census, that in 12,000 from each of these. This is when music for John's ears, for every Jew, they would have understood this. 144,000 feels like this complete number. It's a short number. I don't know if I made that, but um, 144,000 is a play on numbers. 
four, uh, 12 times 12, 12 tribes of Israel is 144, 10 times 10. 10 is a symbol of completion, is a symbol of multitude. So 10 times 10, that's 1,444,000. So it's more of a symbol than anything, but it resonates with the heart of John. He went to skip a beat. All this Old Testament prophecy of God preserving a remnant of Israel, God's people. This is the end. This is what he's been taught. He's been preached at for so long. This conquering line of Judah being fulfilled. This strong messianic champion actually helping build his kingdom. The 12 tribes even now are listed almost like this military census in this chapter. The sense of power and conquer. He's hearing this vision. And then he turns and he gets a very different view. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches, not weapons, in their hands. And crying out with loud voice, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then one of the elders addressed me, who are these clothed in white robes? And from where did they come? And I said to them, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So we see this contrast between um, these two visions. Vision one, it's all kind of these, this Hebrew expectation of these end times, what they would expect in the Jewish mind. There's, but it's, he turns, and what he sees is not a select remnant of Israel, but people from all over. This has been the most unexpected thing for John. Similar to chapter 5, when John hears the conquering lion, he turns and he sees a slain lamb. In the same way, the end-time army of Israel turns out to be the host of martyrs from amongst the nations. Jesus is constantly reconstructing who we think the people of God should be. We see this in Matthew 19. Two stories that Matthew shares back to back for this very reason. The first one, Jesus is teaching his disciples and a bunch of others. They're listening to him. He's sitting there as a rabbi. They're all sitting at his feet. This would have been expected. And then kids run over to him. Parents want their their kids to be blessed. And disciples do what probably they should do. They protect the rabbi because he's in the middle of teaching. They play defense. and They're saying, get out of here. Like, go play hockey or whatever. This isn't the time to bug him. And Jesus actually gets mad about this and says, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And the disciples are actually like, it's off-putting. They don't, they're confused by this statement. This is something even cheeky. And Jesus grabs a kid and puts him on his lap and keeps teaching. He's trying to make a point of this. The disciples don't know what to do with this. They, the, the kingdom of God belongs to, to them? These are like the least of these. What are we talking about? And his story right after that, Jesus is teaching again this affluent young man who is wealthy, a prime candidate to be a disciple. This is what we want. He knows the law well. He lives a, seems to live a pretty moral life. He asks Jesus a really intelligent question. What do I need to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, sell everything you have and come follow me. And it says he went away sad. And they're debriefing after this. The disciples are like, okay, that man who's affluent, wealthy, this prime candidate of disciple, he doesn't get the kingdom of God, but these kids exemplify it. Jesus is constantly shaking up who we think is in and out. In the same way, when we think about this great multitude, who we think is in. We can fall into one or two ditches. We can fall into this ditch where it's religion. We think heaven is very empty. There's 14 guys reading Reformed theology, and that's about it. Like we think it takes a lot to get into heaven. You never admit it, but you think you have to earn it. You do everything right. You really care about those lines of morality, of who you think deserves to be in the kingdom of God and who doesn't. And there's this side. When you see the, the parable of the young children, you're like, that makes a lot of sense to me. This, you fall into the ditch of universalism, where you think everyone will make into heaven. Hell is empty. There's no one there. Everyone is in heaven. The grace and love of God abounds for everyone. Everyone accepts it. God's doors are wide open. And maybe it's not even a theological issue for you of where you think, who makes it and who doesn't. You just look at your own life. And you read the 144,000. You think about the great multitude. And you're not sure if you're in that. You've wrestled with this question, same as Peter says 
out of all this wrestle, these two stories of having, he says, then who can be saved? I don't understand this. And you look in the mirror in your own life, and you think about, am I in that? How do I know I'm in that? I look at my life, I look at what I've done, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I fit the requirements of that. Let me just end with one parable, a third parable. It actually uses a lot of revelation imagery. We see a great banquet, which we'll get to in a couple of chapters. We see this idea of these wedding clothing, these white robes that these people are wearing in this parable. Jesus shares a parable in Matthew 22. He says, the kingdom of heaven is a lot like a great wedding feast of a king prepares for his son. So the king sends out all these invitations to the select crew of people that he knows should be invited. This crew actually doesn't have any interest to go to the wedding feast. They resist all the servants who send out the invitations. They actually mock them. At one point, they make a second run. and the second run, some of them actually even beat up the servants and kill them. The speaking of kind of the Old Testament prophets. And so the master, king, says, okay, enough. We're done with these people. And I'm actually going to send out a whole new ray of invitations. This is what it says in verse 8. Then he said to the servants, the wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And the servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who was not wearing wedding garments. He said to them, friend, how did you get in without wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his descendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him out into the darkness. For those who think it's an open door, you think everyone is heaven, 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 there is only one way into the wedding party. The wedding guests, as Revelation says, they are washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. It doesn't matter how impressive you are. If you're like the rich young ruler, you cannot jump the fence. There's no other way in. There's no amount of intelligence, self-righteousness, community influence, world impact that will get you in the door. It is only, only through accepting what Christ has done for you on the cross, paying the full debt for you. The great multitude are made up of people that don't wear their own accolades, success, goodness, but have traded it in for Jesus' robes. That's the only thing all of us have in common. It is only through the life of Jesus. But those in this room maybe who are feeling unsure, I don't know if I fit in that. I don't know if I've I measured up to that. I don't know if I've even accepted that. I, don't, I look at my life and I think about there's so much stacked against me. I don't even think I'll be invited to the party. Man, this story just makes it so clear. He makes it known that his grace is further reaching than you can ever imagine, gathering all they could find. Anyone, bad, good, the wedding house was packed to the brim. That is the message of grace. It doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've come from, doesn't matter what family you're from, doesn't matter your career, doesn't matter how much you've failed in life, the invitation is there. The invitation of the kingdom, his kingdom is always open to anyone who recognizes their need to him. And if that's you, join in with all of creation, saying, come, not only to this world with all the injustice, all the pain and the misery, but come into my very life in this moment. The invitation is available. Father, I pray this morning that we would be a church that we recognize the who's stomping through the world. We recognize there's pain, there's misery. But we be a people marked by your kingdom in light of all the resistance that many of us in this room just really feel. Like we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. We think pursuing Jesus with everything I have isn't going to bring resistance to my life. So there's real things happening in our community. Real pain, real misery. 
And Lord, I pray in spite of that, as we are people marked by your kingdom, we would be about compassion, we about kindness, sacrificial love, your goodness. We'd be people entrenched in justice, obsessed with goodness. Lord, in a world that is hurting, we would be reprieve. Or we would be people that would call out to you, come, bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, in Surrey, in Calgary, in Toronto, in Winnipeg, in Langley. Jesus, bring your kingdom, your goodness to these cities that don't know you, that are dying, that are far from you. Help us look at our lives, what we bring to the table. Help us be more discerning for those who just have a, a dead prayer life, just like, I haven't prayed in months. I don't even know how to. We just wake up every morning just saying that one prayer, Matthew 6, just calling out to you to do your work, not only in our lives, but our city, our country, and our world. We pray this all in your beautiful name.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here today in this place. Church, why don't you stand with us as we just close in worship today. We sing, How Great the Chasm. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope could imagine who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my sin sing the cross Cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of Kings calls me His own, amen. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. So we say.
Amen. And so we say thank you, Father, for your presence today in this place. We give you glory and we give you honor. We give you praise and thanks. In your powerful and mighty name, I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Village Church Online. My name is Jeremy. I am the senior pastor of Village Church, and I'm so glad that you did join us. Now, I would love for you to get connected to a physical location of Village Church, if that's possible for you. If you live near one of our locations, we have seven in different cities across our country. You can go to Village Church. This is villagechurch.com, and you can check out where all of our locations are and see if there is one near you. And if you would like to be supportive of the ministry of Village Church and partner with us financially, you can do that online as well. This is villagechurch.com give. Well, thanks for joining us. I hope you had a great experience with our service.